Hello once again, I'm Extra Life. Last time in the studio we assembled the very first pre-production prototype of the Super 16 sequencer, and today I'd like to make it look a little bit more presentable and add some features to it that'll make it a lot more fun to play. Today, we are going to take a look at making a front panel for a Eurorack module in the cheapest way possible. I doubt if this is the fastest way, and it's probably not even the easiest way, but I think it probably has the lowest barrier to entry of any method. We have here the sequencer module that I've been working on prototyping, and it's a standard Eurorack height. And this is some aluminum sheet. I think this is 1 32nd inch. I would recommend getting something a little bit thicker, but it has a lot of points of attachment on this module, so it should be okay. I got this cut down at a local sheet metal shop, and they nearly laughed at me when I told them the quantity that I needed, but they were very nice about it, and they cut it for me anyway because they had some offcuts that they weren't going to sell anyhow. I think I'm probably the first person who ever came through their shop and made a pickup using nothing but a bus pass. First thing we need to do is cut the panel down to size. I think this is 22 horizontal pitch, but you know, who's counting? So we'll just make a couple of marks and make sure that it's square to our surface. I already had the guys at the sheet metal place cut this down to size so that I could make strips of modules. There are a lot of ways to cut this. You could use a Dremel tool, you could use a hacksaw, but by far the quickest and easiest are tin snips or aviation snips. And these come in a couple different types, but the yellow ones are for cutting straight lines, and the red and the green ones are for cutting left and right-handed curves. So make sure you have the right set. Next, we can cut out our drawing of the front panel and get it ready for marking. Once the label is affixed, we can use a center punch to mark out all the spots where we need to drill holes for components, and then we'll use the components themselves to size the drill bit. Now there's lots of different component sizes on this board, from potentiometers to jacks to knobs. So you're going to need a fairly substantial set of index drill bits, or you can use one of these conical step drill bits. And you can see that there's lots of different sizes marked out here. And you start at the smallest one, and then just step up. And this is nice because it deburrs each hole as you step up to the next size. Okay, this drill is hotter than a $2 pistol, but all of these holes have been drilled out. And you can see in a couple of places we broke through where the controls are too close together. So I think we'll just uh, go ahead and snip the rest of that out and make it a sort of rectangular hole. But if we try and test fit this part, there's a couple of places where the jacks don't quite line up. So we need to adjust the uh, size and position of these holes. And we'll do that with a couple of hand files, a rat tail, uh, and a square file, and if we need to get really serious about it, we'll bring out the big one. Alright, after a little bit of work with the files, we now have a nice press fit. So the next step is to put our mounting holes in the corners, and those sit three millimeters away from the top, and seven and a half millimeters from the edge. There's one more piece that we have to do, and that's this square cutout for the seven segment display. And there's a lot of ways to do square holes. You can uh, drill a hole and then use what's called a nibbler, which is a tool with a nice square edge you can use to kind of chomp away until you get right up close to it. 
Another way would be to drill out a big hole and then use a hacksaw to come in, but this is a pretty small cutout. I don't know if we have the radius to get around with a hacksaw. So what I'm going to do is peck out a bunch of little holes using a small drill bit, and then come in with a nice big square file, which is double cut here. We should have a good material removal rate, and get those corners nice and square. So I've been keeping busy with this project mostly by writing the code that runs the sequencer, the Arduino C++ on the microcontroller inside. And I don't want to go line by line or function by function and tell you what everything does, but to keep you abreast of the latest developments, I've switched from using the Arduino IDE to Microsoft Visual Studio to manage the project. The major issue with the Arduino IDE is that it starts you off keeping everything in one gigantic file. and the whole sequencer code ended up being over a thousand lines, and it just got very difficult to manage. Now, you can add multiple files in Arduino, but if you're going to go to the trouble, you might as well use a proper development tool, and that's what Visual Studio is. And so you can see we actually have a proper file system, a tab manager, C++, and header files. And we still have a master.ino eno file to make this an Arduino project. And of course, there's a plugin for Visual Studio called Visual Micro, which hooks into the Arduino IDE and lets you program the Arduino or your equivalent microcontroller directly from your editor, which is always nice. There's even a more lightweight solution called Visual Studio Code, which is sort of a cross-platform code editor. And there's a plugin for that too, I think it's just called the Arduino plugin, but I haven't played around with that yet. I might switch to it at some point. But for now, switching to Visual Studio has helped me organize the code and write some of the more advanced functions. So let's talk about those. The most critical issue for any sequencer, or really any control voltage device, is for it to be able to play in tune, meaning on pitch. I struggled with how to implement this, but I think I've come up with a way to reliably calibrate the device that works pretty well, and I've stolen some of the features from the Erica Synth DIY MIDI interface. What you do is you press a button and enter calibration mode. And this lets you choose different exact pitches that you can calibrate on. And if we connect this to our oscillator, and at the same time to a digital multimeter, we can tell precisely what voltage we're outputting. So now it's 11 millivolts, pretty close to zero. One octave up, we should be getting exactly one volt. 
So we can adjust the calibration and get a little bit less or dial it in until we get exactly one volt. And then we repeat the process all the way up to the full range of the sequencer. My apologies if your dog started barking just then. When we're satisfied that our calibration is complete, we hit the save button again, and we go back into sequencing mode. And those values are stored in the E squared prom, or electrically erasable, programmable read-only memory. And the Arduino chip has about one kilobyte of E squared prom, and you can use that to store things like calibration values or configuration settings that need to be user editable from the device, but are not going to change that often because you have a fairly limited number of reads and writes to this particular piece of memory, and there's not much of it, but it stays there after you turn the device off, so it's great for storing values that need to be persisted between sessions. Now that we have a sequencer that plays in tune, let's program a major scale. In addition to being able to play in tune, it's critical for any sequencer to be able to play in time. So we can use the internal clock here to play a sequence using the timekeeping of the microcontroller itself. But we might want to play along with some other gear too, for instance Ableton Live or another CV sequencer maybe. If we want to do that, we can connect our computer to a MIDI interface and then take a clock signal from that MIDI and use it to control our sequencer. Now when we change the tempo on Ableton, the sequencer follows along. One other feature of this sequencer that I think is essential is what's called portamento or glide. And it's very common in styles that use the TB303 sequencer, like Acid House. Uh, and it has a particular sound. What you can do is select a step and then engage the slide for that step by pushing this button. Now, the slide happens at the beginning of the note and then ramps down or up to the pitch of that note over its duration. So you can create interesting rhythmic and melodic possibilities just by adding slides to existing notes. As you can see, we've now got a pretty capable and musical sequencer out of this machine, and we could even start recording some songs with it. But there's still lots more to do, for instance adding patch memory to store sequences, and scale selection to quantize in different tunings. But I think next I might be ready to take another crack at the circuit board and improve the electrical and mechanical design of the thing to make it more robust and easier to use. 
Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that update and got some idea of what the real capability of this sequencer might be. I'll see you next time.